the Battle of Narva is known to a lot of us, but what actually happened during the bitter struggle for the Estonian border city? In this series, we will dig deeper into the battles of Narva and the battles leading up to it. We will do this by following the 3rd SS Panzer Corps of Felix Steiner, one of the major forces fighting for the historic Estonian city. Before we go to the actual battles of Narva, it is important to know how the fighting ended up there in the first place. The Battle of Narva started on a front called the Oranienbaum Front. This was a pocket that had emerged during the fighting for Leningrad in 1941. The pocket had stood strong all the way up until the winter of 1943 to 1944. To the east of the pocket was Leningrad, where the Germans had besieged the Soviets as early as the 8th of September 1941. Nonetheless, Leningrad or present-day St. Petersburg was still in Soviet hands. In the early days of December 1943, the Dritte SS Panzer Corps were sent from Croatia to the frozen battlefields of the Leningrad Front. The 3rd SS Panzer Corps under the command of SS Gruppenführer Felix Steiner consisted mainly of volunteers from many European countries. The main body of the corps consisted of the 11th SS Volunteer Panzer Grenadier Division Norland. When they moved to the Leningrad Front, they had around 11,400 men in their ranks. This included some 1,400 Danes, 550 Norwegians and a few Finns and Swedes. The 6,000 men strong 4th SS Sturmbrigade Nederland consisted, as the name may suggest, mainly from Dutchmen, although there were some Belgians in the unit as well. The other half of the 6,000 men consisted of Germans from Romania and Hungary. The core staff was some 2,500 men strong. Again, these men were from various nationalities. When the Netherland Brigades departed for Leningrad, they still had to receive their heavy weapons companies and an artillery battalion. These units would arrive during the spring of 1944, when the brigade was taking heavy casualties defending the Narva bridgehead. When the corps moved to the Leningrad front, it was also awaiting their promised Panther tanks. As the fighting force was shifted to the icy battlefields of Leningrad, it fell under the jurisdiction of the 18th Army, which was commanded by General Oberst Lindemann. The Volunteer Corps was allotted the defensive sector around the Oranienbaum pocket. This pocket was a Soviet beachhead on the Gulf of Finland, which had emerged during the fighting for Leningrad in 1941. Already in the area containing the pocket were the men of the 9th and 10th Luftwaffe divisions, forming General Leutnant Oldebracht's 3rd Luftwaffe Field Corps. As the German 3rd SS Panzer Corps was gradually coming into the sector, the Soviet forces were already reinforcing their lines for their offensive coming in January of the next year. Already in the pocket were the members of the 48th, 98th and 168th Rifle Divisions. But with the plans of a new offensive, the 2nd Shock Army was also sent into the pocket. One does, however, have to keep in mind that the proportions of the Soviet units were smaller than those of their German equivalents. On the 5th of December 1943, the staff of the 3rd SS Panzer Corps arrived at its designated headquarters at Klopitsi, south of the Oranienbaum pocket. The day after, engineer units arrived to make the defensive line defendable. These engineers made bunker positions, led mines and performed various other tasks. Finally, the infantry arrived in the form of the Danmark and Norge regiments. 18th Army's commander Lindemann gave the corps the task to defend the western side of the pocket, from where they were to protect the withdrawal routes into Estonia. By the 13th of December, the Nordland Division was finally in position, ready to defend the Oranienbaum pocket. Their 29-kilometer line ran from Gorbovici to Novaya Burja. On the left was the SS Panzer Grenadier Regiment 24 Danmark. The right flank was defended by the sister regiment, the SS Panzer Grenadier Regiment 23 Norge. The divisional headquarters were set up at a place called Kirova. To the right flank of the SS Corps were the 10th and 9th Luftwaffe divisions all the way up to the Gulf of Finland. The left of the Norland division was defended by a mixed unit of the 4th SS Police Division. This unit consisted of various Estonian police battalions and some other units. They held a front all the way west to connect with the Gulf of Finland. Steiner, in command of the 3rd SS Panzer Corps, was worried about the capacity of this 4th SS Police Division, and he ordered his Netherlands Brigade up as soon as it would become available to defend the sector. The various police units would then be placed under the command of Steiner and given a new name. Kampfgruppe Küste, Küste standing for Coast in English, would then be tasked to defend the coastline from the Netherlands defensive positions all the way back to Estonia. 
The Kampfgruppe was placed under the command of the Danish SS Brigadeführer Christian Peter Kriesing. On the 28th of December 1943, the Dutch SS Volunteer Brigade finally arrived on the Oranienbaum front. The day after, the SS Panzer Grenadier Regiment 49, De Reuter, and the SS Panzer Grenadier Regiment 48, General Seifar, took over the 4th SS Police Division's positions, right and left respectively. To the right of the Dutchman was the Nordland Division. The 3rd Battalion of the Denmark Regiment held the left wing of the regiment's front line. They were around Koporie, still maintaining contact with the Dutchman from the Nederland Brigade. The 1st Battalion of the Danish Regiment was located in the right of the regiment's line, running to a point west of Voronino. The 2nd Battalion was kept in reserve. The Norwegians of the Norge Regiment held the line from Voronino to Novaya Burja, with the 2nd Battalion on the left close to the Danes and the 3rd Battalion on the right. The 1st Battalion was kept in reserve. Artillery support was provided by the SS Artillerie Regiment 11. The arrival of the Nederland Brigade brought some changes in the command structure. SS Obersturmmannführer Wolfgang Jürchel, the commander of the Norge Regiment, was shifted to command the Dutch General Seifar Regiment. He would be replaced by SS Sturmmannführer Arnold Stoffers. As of the 29th of December, more and more Nordland units arrived in the area. The Panther tanks of the SS Panzer Abteilung 11, Hermann von Salza, arrived at a secondary line of defense, where they were to stem any potential Soviet breakthroughs should they occur. With the coming of the new year, the Soviets started to increase their activity in the sector, which had until then been pretty quiet. They had also put Lieutenant General Ivan Fedyuninsky, the commander of the 2nd Shock Army, in command of the entire Oranienbaum pocket. Slowly but surely, the Soviets were preparing their offensive to break the siege of Leningrad for once and for all. SS Obersturmmannführer Graf von Westphalen, in command of the Denmark Regiment, became worried about the sudden increase in activity and raiding parties were set up. In the meantime, the Soviet forces brought men and material to the Oranienbaum pocket by means of sea transport. Not only the ground activity increased, as through the clear winter skies the Soviet Air Force also performed multiple successful bombing raids on the defensive positions. The activity in front of the Denmark Regiment had in fact increased. The 168th Rifle Division was brought up to the Koporia sector as a diversion, so that the Germans would think that the Soviets planned to attack along that axis. On the night of the 13th to 14th of January, the Soviets launched their offensive on the Leningrad front. The Second Baltic Front attempted to break out of the Oranienbaum pocket. For such purpose, the Second Shock Army, consisting of two corps with nine Guards divisions and three brigades and a coastal brigade, had been brought into the pocket since November of 1943. In total, some 53,000 men and just over 200 tanks would be brought into the Oranienbaum pocket in the days leading up to the offensive and the week after the start. The Krasnoye Selorobsha offensive, also known as Operation January Thunder, consisted of two main components. Fedyuninsky was to break out of the Oranienbaum pocket to the east and south. At the same time, General Ivan Maslenikov's 42nd Army was to thrust westwards, away from Leningrad, and establish contact with the Oranienbaum pocket. The Soviet 67th Army was to thrust to the southwest to make a total breakout complete. The brunt of the Soviet offensive on the Oranienbaum front fell on the 9th Luftwaffe Division, and within the first hours of the offensive, the Soviets had managed to break through the lines of the Luftwaffe Division. Within a few days, the majority of it would be cut off together with elements of the 126th and 170th Infantry Divisions. Many of the German forces, especially parts of the 9th Luftwaffe Division, were in a chaotic retreat. The Soviets had made a successful attack, the siege of Leningrad was finally broken. General Georg Lindemann, the commander of the German 18th Army, was forced to use the 61st Infantry Division, his only reserve in a desperate attempt to close the gap which had occurred thanks to the new deadly Soviet thrust. The fighting was bitter in the biting cold weather, but nonetheless soldiers showed their courage on both sides. Within the first two weeks of the Soviet offensive, 12 officers and men would earn the Hero of the Soviet Union title, while a few Knights' Crosses were also handed out for the bravery and devotion to duty. This was only the start of a battle that would last until the summer months of the same year, 1944, and which would see many men killed on both sides. 
Feldmarschall von Küchler, in command of Heeresgruppe Nord, quickly ordered his forces at Leningrad back towards the Luga River, a natural obstacle from where the Germans hoped to halt the new Soviet offensive. This decision, however, put Steiner's 3rd SS Panzer Corps in great peril. Hitler was furious and he sacked von Küchler and replaced him with General Oberst Model. But despite the politics, the withdrawal still had to be carried out. The members of the SS Engineer Battalion were the first to endure the Soviet steamroller. Its 2nd company had been placed between the 10th and 9th Luftwaffe divisions to strengthen the defences, but in doing so they became the first ones of Steiner's corps to make contact with the attacking Soviet troops. Their defensive positions were blasted to tree stumps and craters due to the artillery, but by that time the Soviet attackers had already breached the German Luftwaffe positions, breaching the Oranienbaum pocket. At 4pm the Soviets attacked the new hastily made defensive positions of the SS engineers, but after heavy fighting the attackers were compelled to cease their efforts. The following day, January 15, started with a huge artillery barrage followed by an air raid. After the hellish bombardment the infantry attacked. Supported by a few tanks they tried to force the engineers out of their defensive positions. Unfortunately for the attackers, the engineers put up a staunch defence and again the Soviets were compelled to stop the advance under the murderous fire of the SS Pioneer Battalion 11. As the defensive lines were showing more and more cracks, the 1st Battalion of the Norge Regiment under the command of SS Hauptsturmführer Fritz Vogt, a Knights Crossholder from the 1940 campaign in the West, was ordered up. They reached their designated positions just west of Robscha during the night in the early hours of the 15th of January. Supporting Vogt's battalion were some anti-tank guns from the SS Anti-Tank Detachment 11. As the Soviets attacked in the morning of the 15th, the 1st Battalion of the Norga Regiment endured heavy losses under the withering fire from both tanks and infantry. As 6034s were sighted, the assault guns of SS Hauptsturmführer Elezik were called up. But they only arrived at noon and when they arrived they were caught in a crossfire. The crew managed to bail, but all were wounded. As the evening fell over the battlefield, the battalion of the Norga regiment had to retreat to improve the overall situation. On the 17th of January, the 1st battalion of the Norga regiment was pulled back and placed near the villages of Vitino and Diatlitsi. Vogt's battalion remained in the locality up until the 21st of January. By the 17th of January, the Soviet 2nd Shock Army had received new orders. They were to bypass Robsha and seize the main road and railway lines at Gatshina to the south instead. Robsha was during that bitter cold 17th of January defended by members of the 2nd and 3rd companies of the SS Pioneer Battalion 11 and members of the 61st Infantry Division. The Soviet forces cut straight through the Germans endangering the artillery in the rear and as the artillery retreated the defenders of Robsha became entrapped and surrounded. In the extremely close quarters combat that ensued the Germans managed to escape their pocket only to escape to a new one where the SS Reke Battalion 11 was also fighting for its extrication. Having received new reinforcements, the mixed unit of both Heer and Waffen SS soldiers eventually managed to clear a way out of the pocket, albeit by taking incredibly heavy losses. At Steiner's headquarters, messages began to come in, giving the commander of the 3rd SS Panzer Corps an ever clearer picture of the situation. His lines were getting more and more endangered and so he ordered his units to take up a new defensive line, this time running from north to south instead of west to east. The plan was easier said than done, certainly with the chaotic combat and the ever nearing Soviet 2nd Shock Army. On the 22nd of January the Soviets penetrated the lines of the 61st Infantry Division and the advancing Soviets quickly reached the important main road east of Vitino. By 7pm that day the last German defenders were forced to retreat. The costly fight in the east of Vitino gave the 1st Battalion SS Panzer Grenadier Regiment 48, General Seyfar, enough time to set up its defences in the town itself. The Dutch Panzer Grenadiers under the command of SS Hauptsturmführer Rühle von Lilienstem were supported by the SS Engineer Battalion 54 Nederland. During the night, the Soviets continued their advance and with the main road in their hands they had a perfect jump off point to attack the defending Dutchman in Vitino itself. Around 17 attacks were made on the village but the town proved to be too staunchly defended. During the fight however, SS Hauptsturmführer von Lilienstem fell badly wounded. He remained with his unit until the fighting had quieted down again. For his actions that night, von Lilienstem was awarded the Knight's Cross of the Iron Cross. 
In a matter of a few days, the Oranian bomb front had expanded with a successful Soviet offensive. Still holding the line with the 1st Battalion Danmark at Diatlitsi. Due to the Soviet penetration, the line followed at an odd angle where the mixed unit of survivors of the 10th Luftwaffe Division and the 1st Company of the SS Engineer Battalion 11 were holding out. The 1st Battalion of the Norga Regiment was just north of Vitino, and the 1st Battalion General Seyfar was still holding Vitino itself, although only just. To the south of the Vitino Road were the depleted units of the 61st Infantry Division and the SS Aufklärungsabteilung 11. During these chaotic days, various depleted German units streamed through the defensive lines. These units all belonged to divisions that had been fighting closer to Leningrad and were steamrolled by the Soviet offensive. The following day, on the 23rd of January, the Soviets continued their attacks. This time it was the turn of the 1st Battalion Danmark at Diatlitsi. The Danes took incredibly heavy losses trying to hold the tanks and infantry back, but at the end of the day the crippled battalion was still in its defensive positions. At the same time, the Red Army performed probing attacks all along the line until they found a weak spot at Hulguzi. SS Hauptsturmführer Saalbach's reconnaissance battalion 11 was called up to recapture the village. Only slight progress had been made when the day drew to a close. On the 24th of January, the Soviets paused for the first time in their offensive to regroup their leading elements. The Soviet halt was a welcomed gift for the Germans, and the 3rd SS Panzer Corps immediately started to make preparations to pull its forces back, and the retreat commenced the same day. On the following day, the 25th, the Soviets picked up the fight where they had left it two days before. The Denmark Battalion at Diatlitsi was finally forced to withdraw after taking heavy casualties. During the day's attack, their commander, SS Hauptsturmführer Wichmann, was killed. The battalion thus fell under the command of the Danish SS Hauptsturmführer Per Sörensen. The Denmark battalion, now under Sörensen, successfully retreated through the thick snow to Vitino, where they were immediately thrown into the defense. Sörensen, under the command of the General Seyfar battalion, decided that staying to defend Vitino was unwise and both commanders agreed that they should leave the town on the 27th at the latest. That same 25th of January, Kampfgruppe Helling, which consisted out of the survivors of the 10th Luftwaffe Division and the 1st Company of the SS Engineer Battalion 11, became surrounded. Towards the evening, a breakout attempt was made. After marching for several hours without knowing anything of the situation, they stumbled upon a German outpost. They had escaped Soviet captivity and could fight another day. In the early hours of the 26th of January, the Soviets attacked the town of Gubanitsi with tanks and infantry. The town was defended by the members of the SS Aufklärungsabteilung 11, still under the command of Saalbach. Under the cover of darkness, the Soviet tanks rolled through the village. Upon hearing the perilous situation, Saalbach quickly ordered the rest of his battalion forward, and a huge armoured battle for Gubanitsi ensued. The village still remained in Soviet hands, but several of their tanks had been knocked out. Immediately after the battle at Gubanitsi, the Reke battalion was ordered to the town of Olosovo, where there was an important railway line. Members of the 227th Infantry Division were desperately holding on to the town, but they were in dire need of armoured reinforcements. The line might have held that day, the fighting had dangerously thinned the defenders. There was no other option but to retreat. Up until the 26th of January, the Nordlands Division and the Netherlands Brigade had been fighting the Soviet attackers of the 2nd Shock Army in the worst of conditions. They continuously had to retreat and set up new defences in the cold snow of the first month of the year. But thanks to the staunch defence carried out by the many volunteer units, a part of the nearly completely destroyed Leningrad Front managed to retreat. The 18th Army had endured an incredible number of casualties. The Germans realized that they would be unable to hold the Soviets back from their battered positions on the Oranienbaum front, so Steiner ordered the retreat of his units. The 3rd SS Panzer Corps was to break contact with the Red Army and retreat towards the Luga River, from where the Germans hoped to halt the Soviet offensive. The artillery and other heavy units went first. They departed westwards as early as the afternoon of the 26th of January 1944. As the Oranienbaum front became untenable to hold, it was decided that the abandonment of the Oranienbaum sector was the best option. The defending forces were to go to the Luga River line defences instead from where they hoped to hold the Soviet forces. 
Find out more about a retreat from the Oranienbaum front to the battles on the Luga River line in the next episode of this Narva 1944 series. This was the Ace Destroyer, I hope you enjoyed this video, if you did why not give it a thumbs up and subscribe. Also don't forget to leave a comment down below. I will hopefully see you in the next episode, cheers!